I pulled up my truck into the Pine Barrens, a hunting ground in New Jersey. I nodded a silent greeting to my old friend, Jasper Reynolds, who approached with his hunting gear ready. Jim, it's been too long, he said, grinning as he slapped my back. My career's kept me pretty busy, I admitted. The group began to gather, and we set off into the woods in search of deer. As we walked, I felt something wasn't right. The woods seemed eerily quiet. I shook off the feeling, focusing on the task at hand. A couple of hours into our hunt, still no sign of deer. Instead, we found something terrifying, a mutilated body. No ordinary animal could have done this. The group exchanged looks of fear and panic, but nobody called for help. Our location was far too remote for any signal. We decided to leave immediately. As we picked our way back through the woods, Jasper suddenly disappeared from view. Jasper, I shouted, but received no response. His disappearance spurred us to move faster. Such a horrifying creature emerged from the shadows around us. It was tall and muscular with razor-sharp claws and teeth that glistened in the moonlight. It had reddish fur and yellow eyes that burned with malice. The creature lunged at us with ferocious speed, grabbing one of our group members by the throat before disappearing into the bushes with its prey. We attempted to follow, but were unnerved by its killing method. Each victim it took was different. Some throats torn out, others ripped limb from limb. It seemed to take pleasure in varying its strategy. We eventually stumbled upon Jasper's body, or what remained of it, mangled almost beyond recognition. We knew that staying together was safer than running for our lives individually. We'd face this monster as one and somehow make it out alive. The creature's stalking continued. It seemed to toy with us, enjoying our terror. We developed a plan to trap the beast, hoping it would be enough to save us. Destroying this creature would be difficult, but we'd use our collective knowledge to survive. As everyone took their positions, the monster appeared again. I readied my rifle, palms sweating with fear and adrenaline. The hunter had become the hunted. The others moved into play around the creature, herding it towards our trap. Jasper would have loved this plan, always one for strategy in the face of adversity. The beast snarled menacingly as it closed in on the trap. We needed precision in our movements and absolute focus in our minds. The trap we set was sturdy, consisting of a deep, rope-lined pit covered with branches and leaves. We led the creature towards it step by step, trying to keep a safe distance. Keep pushing it. Almost there, Sam shouted. Taking one more shot at the beast, I hit its shoulder, further enraging it. It lunged towards me, but as planned, it fell into our trap with a loud crash. Quick, we need to cover it properly if we're going to have a chance of getting out of here, cried Rebecca. We gathered sturdy logs to place on top of the rope net, covering the creature. Luck was not on our side. The creature managed to tear through the rope net and tried climbing out of the pit. Its large claws dug into the earth as it attempted to escape. Everyone called for help. We need assistance now, I commanded. Members of our group picked up their phones and dialed emergency services. The police won't get here in time, cried Daniel. We need to do something ourselves. Instinct took over as I remembered an old farm nearby that house's equipment which could help us contain or possibly transport the creature elsewhere safely until authorities were able to handle the situation better than us. We had nothing left but a speck of hope that we could stall this beast or drive it away from us before more lives would be lost like Jasper's. Making my way to the farm quickly with two other group members, we managed to find a tractor with a large cage originally used for handling aggressive livestock. We attached the tractor to the cage and hurried back towards our friends. As we arrived back at the scene, we moved cautiously towards the pit as cries echoed out from within where our group members were attempting to keep the creature contained by throwing rocks or spraying bear spray in its face every time it tried to escape. As soon as we got close enough, we positioned the tractor's cage in front of the pit and secured it by locking four-wheel drive on the tractor. All right, let's try to get it into the cage. I shouted as Danielle and Sam tried to agitate the creature further by making loud noises hitting pots and pans together. The plan worked. The creature finally emerged from the pit, charging right into the cage with tremendous force. I slammed the cage door shut and locked it immediately. Our group looked exhausted but relieved slightly, knowing that we at least were safe for a little while longer. 
We continued to call for help in hopes that someone would take us seriously. Soon a police officer arrived on scene after we inundated them with calls. Not believing what he saw, he called in reinforcements. The authorities sent a helicopter to transport our newly captured beast to a secure facility before it could cause harm to anyone else. We sat down together, reflecting on our cooperative survival against an unknown predator that had disrupted our lives and taken the life of our friend Jasper. We mourned his loss, but knew that we should celebrate our ability to band together against adversity. Though unknown creatures may continue to exist in this world, it was important for our future endeavors to be cautious when venturing into unknown lands, yet still maintain unwavering solidarity, because even though we couldn't identify this beast or reveal its intentions, we knew that teamwork played a pivotal role in overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds. With relief and gratitude for each other's support, we vowed never to forget Jasper, and how he brought us all closer together in the end, rather than driving us apart like the beast intended. And as we made our way back home, we knew that his sacrifice wouldn't be left behind amidst the forest's shadow west, but would live on as a testament to our collective strength and resilience against all odds. I had a really strange case not too long ago that shook even me to the core. I was sent to a small town in Oregon where there had been multiple reports of some sort of large animal wreaking havoc on local properties. The mayor hired me to deal with the situation. It all started with typical damage to gardens and livestock. Nothing out of the ordinary for a pest control specialist like myself. However, upon arriving at the scene, I found bizarre evidence that suggested this wasn't any ordinary infestation. The first clue was at a seemingly abandoned warehouse near an old river dam. Burn marks scarred the walls, and there were strange symbols graffitied all over the place. As I cautiously entered the building, I noticed odd objects scattered around. What looked like an array of half-eaten animals splayed out messily, a torn-up steel door, was metal its favorite snack. I brought this up with some locals who had gathered nearby to speak with me about their concerns. Oh, said a wiry-haired man named Phil as we stood in the warehouse parking lot. You must be talking about the beast. Some unknown creature roams around, causing destruction. I tried not to roll my eyes at this blatant name-giving of the antagonist, but still nodded solemnly. Well, do any of you have any idea what it may be? I asked. Maybe it's an extraterrestrial, chimed in Sarah, a young woman holding her toddler on her hip. Or some kind of mutant experiment gone wrong, suggested an older man with a trembling hand resting on a nearby cane. Despite their wild speculations, I wasn't about to go hunting for otherworldly beings or science fair rejects. I focused on the task at hand, finding the root cause of these ongoing disturbances, and began setting up my traps and surveillance equipment around town. Agents Mulder and Scully would have to wait. A few days passed with no progress until one cold night, when violent scratching noises echoed through my apartment. I grabbed my flashlight and headed outside, following the sounds. When I arrived back at the warehouse, I discovered my traps had been destroyed, melted metal, bent bars, and that grotesque aroma of burnt hair that feels like acid in your nostrils. Panicked whispers came through my walkie-talkie from one of the local families who had joined me in our makeshift surveillance operation. They were huddled and shaking in their home, describing how something massive appeared suddenly outside their kitchen window before disappearing just as quickly. It sounded uncannily similar to the sudden shatter of glass, which startled me out of my thoughts. My gaze jerked upward to see a monstrous, grotesque figure standing atop the warehouse roof illuminated by faint moonlight. It resembled some unholy blend of wolf and bear, all jagged, coarse fur on its hunched form with patches of terrifying black scales prickling at intervals along its back and limbs. Its eyes gleamed crimson as it stared down at me with a malevolent grin, revealing razor teeth that were far too human for comfort. It snarled. I remained frozen in place. A cold sweat coated me as unseen. Icy fingers gripped my spine. I couldn't just stand there frozen and staring at the menacing figure overhead. I quickly retreated to my apartment, bolted the door, and grabbed my phone. I knew I needed help, so I called the police, giving them a thorough description of what I had seen. They arrived within minutes and listened as I explained everything in detail, from the damages around town to the bizarre creature I had encountered. 
Officer Jenkins said they had received similar reports in recent weeks, but couldn't identify any known animals that fit my description. Before long, word spread throughout the community about our surreal encounter, and locals began sharing their own experiences with the beast. Most accounts corroborated that it was an exceptional predator with unmatched agility and intelligence, able to avoid conventional hunting tactics with ease. After collecting statements from eyewitnesses and gathering photographic evidence of the trail of destruction left by the beast, Officer Jenkins received a tip from an anonymous source. The caller claimed to have crucial information about our monstrous antagonist, but insisted on meeting in person at a neutral location. Jenkins cautiously agreed, and we met the informant at a local diner. He was an elderly man who introduced himself as simply Gerald. He shuffled his way to our table, and wasted no time sharing his story. Gerald explained that he had been researching mythological creatures for decades. He believed the beast was a rare cryptid known as Tagrav, which hailed from ancient pagan mythology. It was described as a wicked demon that would assume physical manifestations to torment its human victims. According to Gerald's findings, Tagrav would thrive on chaos and suffering. It could sense fear and anguish in its victims, making it nearly impossible to capture or kill. The only way to stop it, he proposed, was to expose it during a ritual called the Binding. This arcane ceremony would render Tagrov powerless, halting its evil reign indefinitely. Both Officer Jenkins and I were skeptical, but realized that we had no other leads. We agreed to give Gerald's plan a chance, provided he guided us through the process. He explained that the first step was to gather certain obscure items, which could be easily found in the town's vicinity. Over the next few days, we embarked on an intricate quest across town, leaving no stone unturned as we searched for these unique components. It felt like a race against time as reports of new attacks poured in daily. Once all the elements were collected, Gerald initiated the binding. We watched with apprehension as he began chanting in an archaic language, his voice low and steady. Suddenly, the room filled with an eerie silence, as if Tagrav could sense what was happening. We held our breaths, waiting for some sign that the ritual had worked. And then, just as Gerald finished his incantation, there was a significant decrease in reported incidents. Elation filled our hearts, temporarily overshadowing our concerns about the credibility of Gerald's information and methods. The town seemed to return to normalcy over time. However, the peace would not last long. The local news spread like wildfire. Tagrav had resurfaced and was leaving its mark all over town once more, proving the binding had been ineffective. Overwhelmed with shock and despair, Officer Jenkins and I realized we had failed to stop this deadly antagonist. Our community now lives with the constant underlying dread of Tagrav's unpredictable attacks, forever wondering when our seemingly unstoppable monster will strike next. I was at Lou's Diner, savoring the last bite of my grilled ham and cheese, when I received a call from my boss. Hey Clarence, I need you to head over to 152 Maple Street. They've got some kind of infestation that needs to be taken care of ASAP, he said hurriedly before promptly hanging up. As an exterminator for Deerland Pest Control, I spent most of my days dealing with various unwanted critters, from bugs to squirrels. As I approached 152 Maple Street, a nondescript suburban home in Cleveland, Ohio, the homeowner, a tall woman with frazzled cinnamon brown hair, greeted me anxiously. Thank God you're here, she exclaimed breathlessly. Come in, we'll head down to the basement. The basement looked like any other, cluttered with boxes, old furniture, and spider webs in the corners. But upon closer examination, it was apparent that something was amiss. Something had torn apart countless boxes and even gnawed on the wooden beams supporting the house. What in the world? I muttered under my breath. Ma'am, I said to the homeowner, I think this might be beyond our usual methods. We might have something bigger on our hands than just rats. Just then, we heard a scrabbling sound coming from behind a stack of boxes in the back courtyard, corner of the basement. I motioned for her to stay back as I cautiously approached the source of the noise. With bated breath, I slowly reached out and removed one box from the stack, only to be faced with a monstrous creature unlike any I had ever seen. The hideous beast stood about four feet tall, with dark leathery skin that was mottled with patches of coarse hair. 
Its bulging eyes stared at me menacingly while saliva dripped from its maw, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. I stumbled back in shock, nearly falling onto my client. What, what is that thing? She cried out, her voice trembling with fear. The monstrous being seemed to hiss in recognition of our presence and darted toward us with horrifying speed. Run upstairs. I yelled at the woman, pushing her ahead of me as we scrambled for the basement door. The creature was gaining on us, its grotesque form making short work of the distance between us as its claws tore through the wooden floorboards with a sickening, splintering sound. We slammed the door shut behind us and locked it just as the beast threw itself against it, rattling the entire house while producing a guttural snarl. Bracing myself against the door, I could feel the impact of each blow and clenched my teeth in anticipation of it breaking through at any moment's notice. With one final, enraged cry from the creature, it suddenly went silent. I leaned heavily against the door, struggling to catch my breath while fear pumped adrenaline through my veins. The homeowner trembled, her eyes wide in shock. We need to get out of here, I managed to say through heavy breaths. She nodded silently as we dashed for the front door. Outside on her front lawn, I frantically called my boss to update him on the situation as he was not going to believe what I discovered. As I made the call, my boss answered with a tone of urgency. You've got to be kidding, Clarence. Get the police there now. Keeping the homeowner close, we dialed 911 and relayed our experience to the dispatcher. Within minutes, Cleveland police arrived on the scene, taking our statements while trying to figure out what they were dealing with. As the officers approached the basement door, guns drawn, we could hear only faint noises of the creature inside. They stood silently outside the door, tensed up and ready for anything. A screeching yelp erupted from behind the door as they cautiously opened it. One officer yelled at us to stand back. We watched in terror as two officers descended into the basement, their flashlights illuminating something monstrous in the darkness. Suddenly another police car pulled up to our location. A detective stepped out in haste and introduced himself as Detective Markson. It seemed that we weren't alone in dealing with this unexplainable nightmare. He told us similar incidents had occurred around Cleveland recently, and they traced their origins to an abandoned laboratory where illegal genetic experiments took place. This creature was the product of one such experiment gone wrong, a living nightmare creeping into innocent lives. The homeowner's hands flew to her mouth as she learned of this chilling truth. After several tense minutes in which we heard shots being fired from below and muffled screams from both the officers and the monster, the two policemen emerged with a relieved look on their faces. They explained that they hadn't killed it, but managed to subdue it by severing one of its limbs. While another officer arrested a dusty-looking man trying to escape through an obscured basement entrance. Apparently, he was an ex-laboratory employee who knew about these creatures and had been attempting to capture them for his sinister purposes by setting up traps at various locations. Detective Markson approached us once more before leaving, assuring us that the situation was under control and that they would link the other, similar cases to these developments. He added that the man in custody could face multiple charges for endangering lives and conducting illegal activities. I called my boss, updating him on the situation while thanking the police officers and Detective Markson. Although it seemed the nightmare was over, I couldn't shake off the dread that lingered inside me. Before leaving, I looked at the homeowner who'd been through so much, and I simply said, I hope you'll be able to sleep soundly again. She nodded solemnly, her eyes reflecting despair and newfound wisdom about just how close darkness could creep into our lives. Over time, an eerie silence fell over Cleveland as similar incidents ceased without further encounters. But I knew deep down, whether lurking in some abandoned laboratory or still on the run from authorities, more of these sinister creatures could be out there, waiting for their next unsuspecting victims. I stumbled upon the strangest thing in the woods near Mammoth Cave, Kentucky. My heartbeat quickened as I held my rifle tighter. My name is Arthur Beckstein, and I'm an experienced hunter who's faced countless situations, but nothing prepared me for this. My buddy Thomas Viviano and I were hunting deer when we found a gruesome sight, a scene none of us had encountered while hunting before. We saw an unusual half-eaten corpse hidden beneath a pile of leaves. 
My gut clenched when seeing this. Thomas suggested calling the rangers or the police to help with the situation, but for some reason, our phones lost all signal. Curiosity gripped us both as we kept venturing deeper into these woods. We talked about our lives. Thomas reminisced about his wife and their young children waiting back home. It was in those simple moments that our friendship grew stronger as we shared our own hopes and dreams. The atmosphere changed as night crept in and the darkness engulfed everything around us. There was no moonlight to guide us, only the faint glow of our flashlights. The darkness seemed to press down on us, muffling even our whispered conversations. We heard something in the distance. It was an indescribable sound, but it sent shivers down my spine. The trees seemed to hold their breath as we tried to determine where the noise was coming from. Suddenly, Thomas and I sensed a malevolent presence lurking nearby, watching us intently with fierce eyes that glinted from the shadows cast by the dense foliage. My heart raced as my muscles tensed up like coiled springs, ready for whatever might come charging towards me from beyond visibility's edge. After what seemed like an eternity, Thomas spotted something lurking behind a tree, a strange creature that neither of us had seen before. Even though we were hunters and knew most animals' features, this creature left us bewildered. It stood taller than us, covered in dark fur, and had razor-sharp claws that seemed to be stained with old blood. Thomas shouldered his rifle immediately, but didn't fire, waiting for the creature to make its move. We were frozen in place, praying that our weapons would be enough to stop whatever this thing was if it decided to charge at us. The creature snarled and began to move towards us slowly, like a predator on its final stalk. The tension was palpable as it reached out one clawed hand, its sharpened nails catching the beam of my flashlight. Thomas fired his rifle without warning. The creature screamed in pain as a wave of blood sprayed across the forest floor, steaming in the night's chill. But instead of falling lifelessly to the ground, as any normal animal would have done, it merely stumbled back momentarily before fixing its rage-filled eyes back on us. My body shook with adrenaline-fueled intensity as I aimed my rifle at the creature, both hands unwavering steady, despite their trembling beneath my already sweat-soaked shirt. We couldn't let this monster win. We needed help, but none could be found out here in these lost woods. With the creature advancing, Thomas and I had no choice but to fall back slowly, trying to keep a safe distance between us and the monstrous being. Although we had an opening for a call for help, the dense forest made it impossible to get any signal on our phones. Out of nowhere, a group of campers emerged from a nearby trail, shouting in horror as they caught sight of the creature. The distraction provided us with a brief opportunity to run, but the creature quickly turned its attention back to us in a fit of rage. It was clear that we wouldn't stand any chance against this beast if it reached our position. I shouted to Thomas, we need to distract it and give those campers time to get away. Thomas nodded in agreement and took aim at a tree branch above the creature's head. At his shot, the branch fell, landing with force on the creature's back. It screeched in anger, but continued moving towards the group of frightened campers. Soon realizing that trying to distract the creature could only buy so much time, Thomas suggested that we lead it away from the campers and deeper into the forest. With heavy hearts, we called out to draw its attention back to us and then sprinted away from the terrified group of people. The creature chased after us relentlessly as we ran deeper into the darkness of the forest. We knew that we had no choice but to keep going, stopping now would only result in our demise. As we sprinted around trees and leaped over fallen logs, a fierce growl rang out echoing through the forest. Suddenly, countless similar growls answered in chorus across the vast wooded land. Fear gripped me as I realized there were more of these creatures out there. The realization that those cries belonged to more creatures like our pursuer brought a wave of terror unlike anything I had ever experienced before because they sounded like they were converging on our position. Thomas and I continued to run, our exhaustion mounting with every step we took. There was no time to regroup or devise a plan to confront the creatures. All that mattered was survival. Suddenly, a guttural snarl broke through the air just as one of the creatures launched itself at us from behind a tree. The force of the impact threw both Thomas and me onto the forest floor. 
Before we could react, another one of these monsters lunged at Thomas, its razor-sharp claws tearing his flesh as he screamed in pain. Desperate to save my friend, I fired off multiple shots at the monster attacking him. The animal retreated, but only for a moment, allowing me just enough time to drag Thomas's injured body further into the dark abyss of the forest. I knew it was only a matter of time before the beasts would catch up to us again. I covered Thomas with leaves and branches, attempting to hide him from sight. Stay here, I whispered urgently. I'll lure them away. Tears filled my eyes as I ran, forcing myself not to look back at my friend's bloody form on the ground. Now more than ever, it was crucial that I called for help. As I sprinted towards what remained of the path ahead of us, hoping it would lead me back to civilization and a chance of rescue, multiple growls followed closely on my heels, causing me nearly unbearable panic. Finally catching sight of distant headlights through a break in the trees, I broke out into the open road just as a police cruiser came skidding to a halt nearby. Relief surged through me as I began telling them about Thomas and the monstrous beasts lurking in the woods. The officer quickly radioed for backup while recounting our story with disbelief in his voice. But even though they'd mount their search, equipped with firearms and dogs eager to pick up scents, nobody would be prepared for the hellish task that awaited them. Retracing our steps through the forest to rescue Thomas and confront an army of creatures far beyond even our wildest nightmares. I was up early that morning, eager to begin my hunting expedition deep within the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania. My name's Mason Collinsworth, and I've been hunting these woods for years. Around here you learn to distinguish harmless noises from threatening ones. It's what's kept me alive all these years. What I didn't know was that today would be a day I'd never forget. I have this feeling we're going to find something big out there today. I mentioned to my hunting partner, Clyde Masterson. We've been good friends since childhood, when our love for hunting brought us together. Clyde replied with a skeptical snort. Yeah, you said that last time, and we only found some squirrels. We ventured deeper into the forest, alert and listening intently for any sign of deer or other game. The scent of damp earth filled our nostrils as we moved stealthily through the underbrush with rifles at the ready. It was a peaceful morning, eerily quiet even for this dense woodland. A few hours into our hunt, something caught my attention. An unusual rustling in the nearby bushes that sent chills down my spine. This wasn't your run-of-the-mill squirrel or pack of deer. There was something ominous lurking in the shadows. Clyde cautiously approached the bush with weapon drawn while I covered his back. Before either of us could react, a grotesque creature leapt out and viciously mauled my friend. Its razor-sharp claws tore through Clyde's flesh-like paper as he screamed in agony. We couldn't call for help. Our cell phones had no signal in this remote location. While struggling with the realization that there was nothing left of Clyde but a bloodied heap on the forest floor, I got a closer look at this malevolent monster, which hunted us now. It stood on two legs like a man, yet had crooked limbs and twisted features. This creature was covered in coarse, matted fur and possessed eyes that burned like hellfire. Hardly able to comprehend the horror of what had just transpired, fury coursed through my veins as I raised my rifle and began firing at the beast in a desperate attempt to avenge Clyde's death. The abomination screamed in pain and charged at me with incredible speed. I quickly took cover behind a tree, trying to keep a cool head despite knowing that this creature could easily tear me apart. Bang bang. Bang! I continued firing, driven by an intense mixture of fear and anger. This monster had to pay for what it had done to my friend. The creature stumbled but seemed unstoppable. Surely it must have been drawing on its adrenaline-fueled rage, though bullets did little to slow the creature down. It appeared momentarily distracted by the noise or possibly another presence nearby in this brief respite. I knew survival was my top priority. I needed to find a way out or at least hold out long enough for help to arrive. Utilizing my years of hunting experience, I set makeshift traps throughout the area, anything to delay this relentless menace. But even as I scrambled for an escape plan, the creature somehow regenerated lost strength and resumed its pursuit with renewed ferocity. While making my way through the forest towards higher ground, someone else's screams echoed through the woods. 
someone who may be experiencing the same terror that came upon Clyde earlier that day. Was this part of some twisted plan orchestrated by this otherworldly fiend? Evading the implacable creature became increasingly difficult as time wore on. It didn't tire or sleep as natural animals would. I pressed onwards regardless. There had to be some means to end this nightmare once and for all. Suddenly, the woods lit up with gunfire from another direction. Had someone else encountered this beast or was there possibly another one? The outcome seemed bleak no matter the scenario. Relief washed over me as I saw a team of hunters led by Jack, Clyde's older brother, emerge from the dense forest, some distance away. They must have heard my gunshots or the screams of the other victim. I started to run towards them, hoping they would notice me too. I shouted, desperately trying to catch their attention. Finally, our eyes met and Jack called out my name. Wasting no time, I pointed towards the direction of the creature and yelled, It's after us! The hunters readied their weapons and spread out in formation. Help was here, but we were not in the clear yet. This creature somehow managed to evade bullets and return with renewed strength each time we thought it was down for good. I racked my brain for anything about this creature that could be useful in taking it down but came up empty-handed. Before long, a distant guttural roar emerged, accompanied by heavy thuds against the ground, which only grew louder as the creature leaped through the trees towards us. The hunters opened fire as they caught sight of its grotesque form, its muscular body covered with coarse fur and matted with blood, its face twisted in an expression of malice, bearing large razor-sharp teeth, its limbs elongated with powerful hands ending in claws that could rip through flesh like paper. As shots rang out all around me, I realized that calling for help earlier had not crossed my mind due to shock from Clyde's death and my desperate need for survival topped priority. Despite our efforts to stop it, the creature bounded closer, striking down one hunter in a spray of blood and gore before disappearing into the thick underbrush nearby panic set in among the group as we were now prey to a cunning adversary. Jack quickly regained control of our shaken group, issuing orders based on his hunting prowess. We moved through the forest together cautiously and stayed close together per Jack's instruction. Our best hope was to force the creature into an open area to prevent it from employing its deadly hit-and-run tactics. The hunters and I stumbled upon a small clearing, the perfect environment for our showdown. Our breaths shallow, listening for any sign of the creature. It didn't take long before we heard rustling in the bushes around us. As the hunters prepared to fire at any moment, a thought crossed my mind. What if there really were more of these creatures out here? Could this be just one of a species never discovered until now? My thoughts were interrupted by an ear-splitting roar that foreshadowed its resurgence. The attack came swift and brutal as it leaped from the shadows aiming for the closest hunter in its path. We let loose a volley of bullets, but they did not deter the creature from lunging at me with jaws wide open. A sudden burst of pain surged through my arm as it dug into my flesh, causing me to scream. The taste of blood seemed to ignite its fury further as it thrashed my limp body around in its mouth. The other hunters opened fire, but their aim was less precise with me being held hostage by this beast. A loud crack echoed across the clearing, and I felt the grip on my arm weaken. The creature released me and fell onto its side, finally succumbing to blood loss from multiple injuries. Jack had managed a well-aimed shot at a vulnerable spot just below its skull, an inch-perfect maneuver that likely saved my life. Gasping for breath, we gathered in stunned silence around the lifeless creature, our tormentor who we had finally defeated. Jack immediately began dressing my wounds while the others stood guard. Led by Jack, we made our way out of the forest towards Clyde's funeral procession. I looked back one last time at the fallen monster before rejoining my community, forever marked by the events that transpired in those woods. As we paid our respects to Clyde and the other fallen hunter, I couldn't help but wonder how many more of these creatures could be lurking beyond our realm of knowledge. The nightmare may have ended for us, but I knew I could never forget the horrifying ordeal, nor the unspoken fear that someday, another one might come for us. It all began with the sound of my phone vibrating against the kitchen counter. My name's Hank Felton, an exterminator from a small Midwestern town. 
The call came through as I was sipping on my lukewarm coffee and relishing the sweet taste of a cinnamon bun. Is this Felton's extermination? A voice on the other end inquired nervously. Yep, that's me. How can I help you? I replied, well, I've got some infestation problems down at the grain mill. Some kind of creature. He stammered, I'll be right there. I said, grabbing my keys and making my way to the old mill just outside of town. Upon arriving at the location, I noticed that palpable tension hung in the air. The owner of the mill greeted me with sweat-soaked brows and a shaky demeanor. Please help us, Mr. Felton, he pleaded. I can't keep workers here anymore. I assured him I would do what I could and ventured inside to investigate. As I explored deeper into the dimly lit mill, my senses were accosted by an awful reek that grew stronger with every step. It was an odor that churned my stomach, a mix of rotting meat and stale grains. While making my way through the dismal building, something caught my eye, or rather, its absence did. There was no sign of mice or rats at all, not even droppings. Now that was unusual for a grain mill. As I reached the farthest corner of the building, what I saw next made me sick to my stomach. Splattered across the walls and floor were sticky, dark splashes mingled with grain husks, human blood mixed with mashed up insides. My heart rate skyrocketed as I tried to fathom how such grisly injuries could occur in the most unexpected of places. I scrambled back towards the entrance, desperately trying to connect with the mill owner. We need to contact the police. Call an ambulance. Whoever did this needs to be stopped. I shouted, my feeble voice echoing through the otherwise silent mill. But the mill owner was already on his phone, dialing frantically. It appeared that he too had found ghastly remains, prompting him to reach out to law enforcement. As sirens blared in the distance and officers began swarming the property, I couldn't help feeling a gnawing fear deep within my gut. What kind of otherworldly horror could leave such mutilated victims? My dread grew as they brought out body after body, each more ravaged than the last. Flesh torn to shreds and tissues exposed in cruel ways filled my vision, making me feel sick once more. A detective approached me then, a steely expression on her face. Mr. Felton, she said sharply, we'd like you to stay on and consult for this investigation. Taking a deep breath, I managed a weak nod of agreement. This went far beyond my expertise as an exterminator, but perhaps that experience would somehow help us make sense of this impossibly brutal scene. And that's how I ended up working alongside police officers and forensic experts during the grueling follow-up investigation. The employees who managed to survive were traumatized, and their stories were chill-inducing, tales of a monstrous creature that only emerged in darkness, one that feasted on anyone it could catch. As more and more pieces were connected together, some creature pursuing humans inside the depths of the grain mill, it became apparent we weren't simply dealing with another serial killer. This horror transcended our wildest nightmares. It was cruel, relentless, and unseen until it wasn't. Casual chatter among investigators spun wild theories. Some imagined it as a genetically modified beast that had escaped a government lab. Others whispered of an ancient predator awakened by human intrusion into its lair. But as hard as we searched, and despite all the horrors we uncovered, one truth remained fiercely enigmatic. The identity of whatever monster haunted the old grain mill. And now as I stand here in this dreadful darkness, I can feel my mind spinning in circles. The creature, or whatever it was, lurked somewhere nearby. As sirens screeched and armed officers darted from shadow to shadow, as I continued to work closely with the police officers and experts, my extermination skills proved useful to some extent, particularly in understanding the patterns of this creature. It seemed to single out more vulnerable victims, those who were alone or separated from others, much like how a predator in the wild picks off its prey. Our investigations led us to a local historian named Oliver Bramley. He specialized in mythologies and legends, and we hoped he could help us determine the true nature of the beast. I explained, so far, we've been unable to capture this creature physically, but have found evidence that it is attracted to darkness and fear. Oliver's eyes widened with interest as he listened carefully. After a moment of silence, Oliver revealed that there were old tales in the town about a sinister being called the Ravager, a monstrous beast capable of overpowering its prey with overwhelming strength and cunning. The Ravager was said to be a shapeshifter, 
taking on various forms to deceive and disorient its victims. The investigation reached a critical point when another body was discovered at the mill, this time one of our agents, who'd volunteered to be bait. He hadn't come called for help because it appeared as if his phone had been taken from him mid-call. The creature's brutality was unlike anything we'd seen before, a sight that would haunt our team for years to come. Now that we had a name and history for the creature, we decided to focus on how to confront the Ravager without endangering more lives. We remained on high alert in pursuit of the Ravager while keeping our distance from one another. Even just a few feet was deemed unsafe by our experts. But as daylight turned into twilight and then darkness enveloped the mill once more, tension among us grew. Suddenly, a horrible scream echoed through the mill, and the bright lights flickered wildly. In that flickering light, I saw the Ravager for the first time. It was monstrous, a grotesque mix of twisted flesh, sharp teeth, and unnerving eyes. It had caught us off guard and taken down another one of my fellow officers before we knew what was happening. I hesitated for just a moment before pressing the alarm on my radio to signal reinforcements. That moment cost another officer his life. The Ravager moved with shocking speed, faster than humanly possible, and sliced through the air with its vicious claws. The backup arrived quickly, their powerful flashlights piercing through the dim space. For a moment, it was as if the Ravager hesitated in the overwhelming brightness. It gave us just enough time to regroup and escape to safety. But as we gathered outside of the grain mill to catch our breath, we knew the Ravager remained undefeated. It still lurked within those dark corridors, waiting for darkness to descend once more so it could claim further victims in horrifying acts of carnage. There was no more work for me at the mill or in that small Midwestern town. I packed my bags that very night and left without looking back. I knew deep down that whatever secrets lurked within that grain mill would remain undiscovered as long as the Ravager roamed free. As the years passed, whispers about the Ravager and its brutal rampage still haunted me from time to time. And every once in a while, when I'd pass by an abandoned building or an especially dark alleyway, I couldn't help but think about what might be lurking around in search of its next victim prey to its insatiable hunger forever hidden in shadows. I was just starting my shift as a Russian forest ranger on the outskirts of Smolensk when I heard the distressing news. Three hikers had gone missing in the forest. My colleagues and I quickly gathered our gear and headed out to begin the search. There was a palpable tension in the air, but of course none of us expected anything out of the ordinary. The first couple of hours passed uneventfully as our group combed through the dense forest. I remember feeling ever more on edge, but I tried my best to maintain an amicable facade, even cracking jokes to maintain morale. Other rangers soon did the same. As we walked farther into the woods, I recall being suddenly struck by a sickening smell. It was like a mixture of rotten eggs and decaying meat. Puzzled other searchers and I traced the odor to its source. A large sack filled with human bones near the base of a nearby tree. The remains appeared to be gnawed on by some large animals. We radioed for backup and continued our search with heightened urgency. After moving deeper into what seemed like unavoidable portions of the forest, we suddenly entered a clearing that seemed as if it had been specifically designed for some sort of twisted ritual. There were peculiar markings on trees and sharp, jagged stones stood around its perimeter. What caught our eye were three limp beings tied to separate sticks near the center of this macabre circle, spaced evenly apart as if arranged deliberately. As we approached cautiously, one of them raised his head. It was Valentin Novikov, one of my fellow rangers, who'd been scouring these parts earlier that very day. Noticing us, he managed to croak out a plea for help before warning, Beware, I've seen things not meant for this world. Igor Komarov, one of our group members attending to Valentine noticed in horror just how badly his injuries were, as there was blood all over them, cut so deep that they nearly reached the bone, just as the gravity of this horror was sinking in with the other rangers helping free Valentine and the other two hostages. I heard a loud snap come from the edge of the woods. We immediately switched off our flashlights in an attempt to mask ourselves from whatever vile existence awaited us. Were those footsteps? I couldn't believe my ears. It sounded like a heavy breathing beast closing in. 
Dimly visible, I saw a creature emerging from between the tall shadows of trees. Its very presence seemed to cast darkness on any gleams of moonlight trying to reach us. Its form was almost human, yet vastly twisted. It hobbled on mismatched limbs which were grotesquely elongated and warped. The eternity with which it took for it to come closer seemed amplified by agonized rangers trying to suppress their cries under swift breaths. Suddenly, a commotion began as one of our team members unleashed instinctive yells and fired blindly towards that ominously creeping figure. The bullets tore through the darkness, missing the creature by a hair's breadth. I could see its twisted, monstrous face contoured in anger, its eyes burning like hot coals. The other rangers weren't as lucky as me. Their flashlights drew its attention, and it persisted. Pounced on them with a ferocity never observed in any known animal. The scene that unfolded before my eyes was indescribable. The once strong and fearless rangers were being torn apart limb from limb. Blood splattered everywhere, painting the trees and surroundings with gruesome evidence of the ongoing massacre. Those who still had their wits about them tried to call for help on their radios. However, the dense forest seemed to swallow any semblance of signal. The creature continued on its terrible rampage, inflicting horrific injuries upon those who dared stand in its way. It was a picture of destruction and chaos like none I'd ever seen before, enough to make even the strongest stomach turn. For safety measures, we had scattered into smaller groups earlier in our search efforts. A few managed to regroup and launch a coordinated attack on the deformed being. They fired relentlessly upon it, but appeared undeterred by every bullet that lodged into its twisted flesh. It let out an unearthly shriek before rapidly retreating back into the forest depths. Now left in an eerie silence, with mutilated bodies scattered around us, we desperately tried to tend to our wounded comrades. It was clear now that whatever we were dealing with was not of this world. The gruesome attack had left the survivors in shock. Some simply sat there motionless and unresponsive. As we cautiously navigated back towards civilization, trying our best to keep our injured companions alive, we came across Mikhail Vasiliev, a local hermit known for his peculiar ways, but also his knowledge of the forest's darker secrets. As he caught sight of our bloodied forms, his eyes widened in terror. He muttered about ancient legends of a creature once thought to be a mere myth. Cherny Vlastelin, they called it. Mikhail said this creature was a force older than the forest itself, one that feasted on human flesh and toyed with its prey. I couldn't help but feel that the being's malicious intelligence was far more terrifying than its appetite for gore. By some miracle, our group managed to return to safety and report our harrowing encounter. Those left behind in the forest would be remembered for their bravery, but officially declared as missing. Their true fate was simply too disturbing for outsiders to comprehend. Months later, despite our survival and the few shreds of evidence we had managed to gather, Experts from various fields dismissed our accounts as a collective hallucination, an unfortunate result of trauma and panic after getting lost in the woods. However, that unsettling presence remains, lurking somewhere deep within the forest, waiting for its next prey and biding its time until we let our guard down once again. Cherny Vlastelin is still out there. Sometimes, as I drift off to sleep, I can almost hear those ear-splitting shrieks echo throughout my mind a constant reminder of what happened in that twisted clearing. While the world may never believe our story or fully understand the horrors we experienced, one thing is certain. The beast will carry on with its unspeakable acts until fate brings it upon another hapless group that dares venture into its territory. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was miles deep into the woods of Greenvale, a small town in the northeast of Alabama. Hunting has always been a way for me to escape the mundane corporate world I lived in. That same world, where as a middle-aged divorcee, life had become increasingly monotonous. My name's Kyle Anderson, and today's hunt changed everything for me. My friends had dared me to come here despite hearing disturbing stories of missing hunters. Some said they were attacked by bears or got lost, while others claimed something far more sinister a vicious creature called the Greenvale Stalker. But me, skeptical as ever, merely dismissed these tales as local campfire legends. This one morning found me tracking deer through the dense forest. My boots crunched over twigs and leaves quietly, 
each methodical step calculated to ensure stealth. It didn't take long before I found fresh tracks. A strong sense of excitement surged through my veins as I followed them deeper into the woods. Eventually it happened. The unusual sound of a fawn squealing caught my ear like no other animal cry I'd ever heard before. In the blink of an eye, the sound ceased, and all was silent again. My heart pounded. This felt wrong. Wading through the increasingly dense overgrowth, my breath hitched when I stumbled upon something truly horrific. A scene straight out of someone's nightmares. A brutalized fawn lay dead on the ground before me. Its body violently ripped open in a way that couldn't have been from any animal I'd encountered in decades of hunting. As repulsive as that sight was, nothing could have prepared me for what happened next. No more than 20 yards away was an animal unlike any other I'd seen before. Its grotesque form stood upright on two massively powerful legs that ended in hoofs like hands. Only thing was, they were dripping with blood. It was covered in coarse fur its twisted face resembling a badly mutilated wolf. Yet this thing was way beyond mere beast. Teeth bared, its deep growl echoing menacingly through the trees. I slowly raised my rifle, hands trembling, watching its claws stretch out towards me. Time seemed to stand still as I aimed for the most vital part of the creature. My fingers clenched around the trigger before finally letting the bullet fly. A direct hit, the monstrous animal let out an enraged howl. Incredibly, Despite the impact, it lunged towards me with unnerving speed, throwing my world into chaos as everything. I stepped into the chilly forest in Humboldt County, California, accompanied by the sounds of my heavy breath and boots crunching dry leaves and twigs. My name is Ernest Coleman, a skilled hunter, and my sole focus today was tracking down a ten-point buck that had eluded me for days. A faint creaking above caught my attention, branches swayed unnaturally. I knew this place like the back of my hand, but something didn't seem right. I tried to brush off those thoughts, thinking it was just pre-hunt nerves. Having been raised by a single father, hunting was always our bonding activity. It provided a much-needed distraction from the demands of our everyday existence. As I walked deeper into the woods, uneasy laughter echoed nearby. The sound sent chills down my spine. People, in these parts? Shrugging it off as a possible coincidence, I continued onward. A sudden rustling near a bush caught my attention. I approached cautiously when suddenly, a man stumbled out from behind it. Please, you gotta help me. He wheezed out of breath, as if he'd been running for hours. There's something in these woods. The terror in his eyes seemed genuine enough. What's after you? I asked skeptically. I don't know what it is. He answered frantic. It's not human. It attacked and took my buddy. With a mix of curiosity and caution pushing me forward, we retraced his terrified steps. Jagged claw marks gouged the trees higher than any bear could reach. It was puzzling. We stumbled upon an abandoned campsite littered with shredded equipment. The smell of coppery blood hung in the air. Remains were strewn around like discarded dolls. As an experienced hunter, I couldn't imagine any creature capable of this savagery. Fanatical whisperings about an unknown beast floated through my mind, but I tried to focus on more plausible explanations. After all, these woods were my territory, and nothing had ever scared me like this before. We continued cautiously, seeking answers. More claw marks appeared, each scarier than the last. Were they a warning or a taunt from this mysterious creature? Time seemed to lose all meaning as we ventured further into the darkening forest. Suddenly, an unmistakable growl reverberated around us. We froze, trying to pinpoint its source. The underbrush rustled again, and a hulking figure emerged from the shadows. It was an ungodly mix of man and beast, muscular limbs ended in wicked claws. Its snarling mouth showcased rows of razor-sharp teeth. Its eyes bore into our souls with relentless hunger. The creature before us snorted with fury, dripping saliva as it reared up on its powerful hind legs. Call for help! I shouted at the terrified man beside me. His hands trembled, but he managed to grab his phone and dial what seemed like the emergency number. However, the reception was barely audible. Realizing that there would be no help arriving in time, we focused on doing whatever we needed to do to get away from this horrifying beast. Desperate to create some distance between us and our monstrous assailant, I scanned the area for a potential plan. There, up the tree, I shouted 
pointing in the direction of a large oak tree standing tall nearby. We sprinted toward the tree with adrenaline surging through our veins. Gripping onto the first branch we could reach, we hoisted ourselves up one limb after another until we were about 20 feet from the forest floor. As I glanced downward, my heart dropped into my stomach as I watched the creature follow suit with its grotesque limbs gripping onto each branch effortlessly. In a panic, I looked around for potential weapons or methods of escape and spotted a large dead branch about five feet away. As carefully and quickly as possible, I grabbed hold of it and snapped it off from its connection to the tree trunk. Catching my breath, I glanced down again at our revolting pursuer. It surveyed us hungrily but with hesitation, seemingly trying to gauge whether it was worth continuing its relentless climb or not. Taking advantage of this brief pause, I began swinging the large branch at it with all my strength as it resumed climbing towards us. The creature snarled at me in frustration, narrowly dodging each swing of my makeshift weapon. Fearing that our lives were on a razor's edge and with my energy waning quickly, I mustered one final blow using every ounce of strength left within me. Striking it square in the face with a powerful, resounding crack, the creature froze for a moment before losing its grip on the tree. As it plummeted to the ground, its disgusting body crumpled under the force of gravity and crashed heavily against the forest floor. It let out a sickening groan before lying still. Exhausted and relieved, we started making our way back down. Once safely on solid ground, we cautiously approached the motionless monstrosity. Unwilling to assume that we were truly safe, we ensured that it was indeed dead and unable to cause further harm. The sight that lay before us proved that whatever this creature had once been, it was now truly just an aberration, a twisted mix of man and animal. After taking a moment to collect ourselves, we noticed searchlights in the distance, accompanied by distant calls of our names. It seemed help had finally arrived in response to our desperate call from earlier. As authorities arrived, they surveyed the grisly scene in disbelief. They urged us to leave further investigation and clean up to them, trying to shield us as much as possible from any additional trauma. In the following days and weeks, although life continued as normal for most people, unaware of what had transpired in the woods that night, neither of us could shake off what we had encountered. I resumed hunting, but often found myself tensely scanning my surroundings in fear of being confronted by another nightmarish creature, like the one that still haunted my thoughts. I frequently visited the man I had helped save on that horrifying evening. While grateful for my assistance during our ordeal, he couldn't help but mourn for his friend, who had been taken from him by such a repulsive being. Life would never be quite the same after our chilling encounter. However, Amid all of these nerve-wracking memories, one small piece of solace remained, knowing that, thanks to our quick thinking and determination, at least one of these twisted monsters had been stopped. Still, the lingering question from that treacherous night nagged at us both. How many more of these creatures might exist, prowling in the shadows of the forest? I consider myself to be just an average guy. I like watching old sitcoms and complain about the weather more often than I'd like to admit. But something happened to me a few weeks ago, while I was out on a job as an exterminator, that made me reconsider just how ordinary my life really is. My name is Herman Dunkirk, and I've been an exterminator for over a decade. I'm used to dealing with roaches, mice, and the occasional opossum or raccoon trying to make a home in someone's garage. But this particular job took me to a small town in Idaho called Farther Frost. I had never heard of it before this assignment, but hey, it's work. Instead of my usual rodent problems, this time I was hired by a man named Bradley, who claimed he had an infestation of strange creatures lurking in the crawl space under his house. They said they sounded like animals, but somehow they were off in some way. I arrived at his place one afternoon around 5.43 p.m., feeling irritable after spending hours identifying the right exit off the freeway. My grumbling stomach made me wish I had grabbed lunch before starting the job. Bradley greeted me with a mop of unruly hair and sweaty hands that were more palm than grip as we shook hands. The noises are loudest down here, he said nervously, leading me to a trapdoor leading under the house. We descended into darkness, 
I couldn't help feeling creeped out by how little light filtered through from above. Soon enough, Bradley and I came across piles of mangled clothes stashed away along with gnawed wooden beams. I suspected raccoons at first, Bradley explained as we continued through the crawl space. But when I saw those, I knew it had to be something else. At that moment, we heard unusual scraping sounds nearby. It sounded as if someone was dragging a large sack of gravel. The strange noise sent chills down my back, making me question what kind of creature we were dealing with. I clicked on my flashlight to get a better look at our surroundings. There it was, lurking mere feet away from us. The horrid thing resembled a human, but was alarmingly distorted. Bulging muscles stretched its grayish skin, mouth open to reveal rows of jagged teeth, and eyes that felt like they could burn through your soul. Without a moment's hesitation, the creature lunged forward towards Bradley, who screamed out in terror. Adrenaline surged through me as I tried to think logically about what to do next. I pulled out my stun gun from my belt and used it on the beast. It snarled at me in response, readying for another attack. When I sprayed some pesticide towards the creature's face, it stumbled back, its skin sizzling from the chemicals, before scurrying deeper into the darkness. Are you okay? I asked Bradley, assisting him to his feet. Before he could respond, we heard more of those gut-wrenching sounds. Not just one creature this time, but numerous. It was clear that we were heavily outnumbered. My fight-or-flight instinct kicked in as I came up with an escape plan. We need to get out of here. I shouted over the noises that seemed to be closing in on us. We scrambled towards the trapdoor, amidst their growls and screeching, sweat pouring down our faces and our hearts pounding like drums in our chests. It felt like our lives were on the line as we raced towards safety. Once we'd escaped the crawl space, Bradley slammed the trapdoor closed behind us. Our breathing was heavy, and our minds were racing with a million questions. Why didn't you call for help when you first encountered this? I asked Bradley, struggling to comprehend why someone wouldn't seek assistance when dealing with such horrors. I did, but no one believed me, he said with desperation in his voice. I was labeled a lunatic by everyone who caught wind of my story. You were my last hope. We knew we had to find out more about these creatures in order to devise a plan to rid the house of them. Our only lead was to contact a local historian who might provide some answers. We set up a meeting with an elderly woman named Agnes, who agreed to lend her expertise on the town's history. Upon meeting with Agnes, she stared intently at us, as though trying to assess how much we already knew. We decided to be open with her about our experience underneath Bradley's house. She listened intently and nodded as we recounted our experience. The creatures you describe have been part of our town's dark past for generations. Agnes began her voice wavering. They are known as the Father Frost Fiends. She went on to explain the origins of these monstrosities, once human beings who delved too heavily into dark arts and corruption, transforming into malicious entities that preyed on unsuspecting victims. After learning everything we could from Agnes, including the potential weaknesses of the creatures, we returned to Bradley's home with newfound determination and courage. Our strategy was to force them out by exploiting their vulnerability to certain chemicals found in commercial-grade bug spray. While incapable of killing them outright, it would weaken and potentially drive them away from the area. While spraying the chemicals into the crawlspace entrance, we heard their ghastly screams of pain and frustration echo through the wooden structure. As a last resort, we placed motion-activated floodlights around the perimeter of the house, hoping it would deter them from returning. We stood at a distance, monitoring the situation all throughout the night. Though the screams seemed to subside, there was a palpable unease in the air that never lifted. A few days later, Bradley had yet to experience any more issues with the Father Frost fiends. However, other residents began reporting similar encounters with these creatures around town. It seemed that by driving them out of Bradley's home, we had inadvertently spread their terror throughout Father Frost. As I prepared to leave town, feeling conflicted about my role and what had transpired, Agnes approached me. Don't beat yourself up over this, she said solemnly. These creatures will always find a way to plague the lives of those who live here but at least you were brave enough to confront them head on. As I drove away from Father Frost, watching it disappear through my rearview mirror into an uncertain future, 
I couldn't help but ponder the long-term consequences of our actions. Were we successful in diminishing their power, or had we only exacerbated the problem by spreading them around town? It was during my break at the small town coffee shop that I realized my passion for coffee. On this particular day, I just finished a grueling extermination job at an old Victorian house when I decided to grab a cup of joe. I found myself ordering a double espresso from the tired-looking barista while muttering some wisecrack to lighten the mood. Now let me tell you about this particular extermination job I had been called for. It all began a couple of weeks ago. My boss, Jonah Barr, sent me to the town of Lansdale, Pennsylvania. We had received numerous complaints about an infestation of sorts that nobody seemed to be able to figure out, so I knew that whatever awaited me, there wouldn't be your average extermination gig. As the days passed by and I worked on various properties, there seemed to be something more sinister going on that even the most experienced exterminators were baffled by. Whispers of strange happenings and mysterious creatures circulated through the town folks' conversations, though they seemed reluctant to share any more details with an outsider like me. One chilly evening, after wrapping up at yet another desperately infested home, I stumbled upon a woman trembling outside her front door. She looked frantic and disheveled as she told me about a hideous creature in her basement that had shredded her beloved collection of vinyl records. She described it as something she had never seen before, an unnaturally tall entity with long limbs and twisted claws perfect for ripping things apart. I could tell she was serious about what she'd witnessed, so without hesitation, I made my way to her home's grimy basement. The air was heavy and thick, and the smell of mold was unlike anything I had ever experienced in decades of working in pest control. As I searched every corner and crevice with my flashlight, something suddenly sparked my attention halfway up one wall. Smeared markings that seemed to be a combination of claw marks and a thick, viscous substance that had an overpowering stench. I carefully examined the substance and noticed it was much too bizarre to be anything related to an infestation I'd previously encountered. This wasn't just an ordinary job. Unbeknownst to me, an eerie presence slithered in the shadows, biding its time until I had my back turned. It struck with such force that I tumbled across the slimy basement floor. My experience as an exterminator told me that retreat would be futile. So mustering all my strength and courage, I rose to face this mysterious creature head on. Despite my cunning maneuvers and attempts to trap the elusive attacker, it always seemed to be one step ahead of me. The creature leaped from wall to wall with grace and agility, defying logic and the limits of any living creature I'd encountered. All of a sudden, the monstrous figure lunged towards me and scuffed my arm with its serrated claw-like arm extension, flinging me into a crumbling stack of boxes filled with long-forgotten possessions. Just when I thought the end was imminent, a ray of light flickered from another part of the basement. At that precise moment, an ear-piercing blast shook the house's foundations as a team of SWAT officers burst through doors and windows. The thunderous cacophony seemed to disorient the creature momentarily, but it wasn't enough for them, or for me, to get the upper hand on our persistent foe. As sirens blared in the background and chaos ensued around us, I knew this wouldn't end well, not for myself nor for those individuals involved in this dire situation. The grotesque being confidently cornered us one by one, despite our desperate efforts to fend it off. It became abundantly clear there was nothing we could do against this unearthly adversary, an antagonist unlike anything we'd ever faced in our darkest nightmares. As the creature's blood-curdling screeches echoed throughout the house, the remaining few of us sought refuge behind a crumbling wall. Trapped behind the deteriorating wall, we could hear the creature outside, its menacing footsteps tapping in an irregular pattern. Recollecting my thoughts, I knew I had to come up with a plan. My years of experience as an exterminator offered no solutions for this supernatural foe, but doing nothing was no longer an option. In a hushed tone, I discussed my idea with the remaining officers, distracting the creature long enough for me to call for backup while they secured the area. Although I could sense their skepticism due to our inability to harm the creature so far, they reluctantly agreed, as we all knew that police reinforcement was our best bet. As two officers cautiously ventured out of our hiding spot, creating noise and drawing the attention of the creature, 
I managed to sneak away to make my call. The department sent a special unit as soon as they heard of our encounter. Meanwhile, our distressing situation escalated when the creature attacked one of the officers and devoured him gruesomely before us, splattering blood and bits of flesh on all nearby surfaces. The other officer managed to escape, back behind the crumbling wall, just in time before being spotted. While waiting in dread for reinforcements, a local historian named Jacob approached us, explaining that he believed he knew what we were dealing with, the Lansdale Lacerator. A horrifying creature thought to be a mere myth, it was notorious for savagely tearing apart its victims with unnerving precision in this small town over the past century. Jacob mentioned that while there were many theories of how it came into existence or what kept it alive, nobody knew for sure. As we pondered these disturbing revelations, our backup arrived and surrounded the house. Prepared with heavy-duty weapons and containment equipment, they strategically ventured inside. The onslaught that followed was truly horrifying. Gunshots rang out in all directions as the limbs of fallen officers joined shattered furniture in a sea of blood-soaked debris. It became chillingly evident that even the special unit was ill-equipped to deal with this otherworldly fiend. As the creature continued its rampage, the survivors retreated to a safe distance. We were bewildered by our failure, knowing that the town of Lansdale would likely suffer the same gruesome fate as our fallen comrades if we didn't find a way to subdue or eliminate this monstrous being. That was when Jacob revealed one last crucial detail. The Lansdale Lacerator could not pursue victims beyond the town's borders. This information practically made me sick. Aware that my extermination job had brought all those involved in this gruesome battle into danger. Forcefully, I instructed everyone to head towards the town limits. In order not to abandon the townsfolk, we made it our mission to warn them of the impending doom and strongly suggest they evacuate as well. As we watched and waited for any sign of that inhuman horror emerging from the decimated house, we grimaced at the destruction left behind. Remains of torn flesh and scattered limbs are frightful reminders of who has met their grisly demise at the wicked claws of the creature. Leaving Lansdale behind us, I remained uneasy, wondering what happened after we escaped its reach. What occurred next in that small town? Does the Lansdale Lacerator still lurk within those borders? The thought sends shivers down our necks. But for now, all we can do is keep moving forward and away from this harrowing experience. There was always something strange about the way my dog, Ace, stared at the walls of our apartment. I'm Jason Fordham, a professional exterminator. It was an honest life, though not particularly glamorous. My job involved dealing with critters that had no business being inside people's homes. Still, it provided a decent income for Ace and me. I had just returned home after a long day of grueling work at three different locations when the phone rang. Is this Fordham's extermination service? Asked an uneasy voice on the other end. Yeah, this is Jason Fordham speaking. What can I do for you? I replied, attempting to exude confidence while I struggled to balance my bag of tools over my shoulder. I, uh, well, I have an infestation, stammered the man. My name's Derek Lowenfield. I live on Ash Street, number 42. Or with your hands tied. I quipped. Derek didn't find that amusing. His voice shook more as he continued. This is serious, Mr. Fordham. There's some creature in my attic making terrible sounds. It's unearthly. No one could say I hadn't encountered bizarre creatures before in my line of work. But something about Derek's voice made my stomach churn. Okay, Mr. Lowenfield, I said it seriously. I'll be there first thing tomorrow morning, if that works for you. With a desperate urgency in his voice, Derek agreed and hung up. Upon arriving at 42 Ash Street, I quickly realized this was no ordinary case. The house looked like it belonged in one of those haunted house movies, rather than in a suburban neighborhood. Gathering my equipment and mentally preparing myself for what might lie ahead, I knocked on the door. Derek opened it almost immediately, sweat dripping down his haggard face. He looked like he hadn't slept in days. Without so much as a greeting, he led me up to the attic. Sure enough, as soon as I entered the room, a shiver ran through my veins, despite my skepticism. The air was unnaturally cold, thick with a foul odor that made me gag. In the corner of the room lay something that would forever haunt my nightmares. The rotting remains of what used to be small animals, all torn to pieces and covered in some sludge-like substance. What on earth? 
I stammered, fighting back disgust and reaching for my flashlight. Suddenly we heard it, an eldritch growl that seemed to reverberate within our very bones. A shadow moved quickly across the wall, distorted and grotesque. Both Derek and I recoiled. As if reacting in time with our anxiety and fear, the creature emerged from behind a stack of boxes. Sharp, glossy black scales rippled across its body as it slithered towards us. Eyes more intense than red-hot coals locked onto ours, paralyzing us with terror. Rows of jagged teeth dripped with venomous saliva. If this thing bites you, God help you. My mind raced as I tried to think of a way to defend ourselves. I snapped out of my terror-induced paralysis and forced my mind to focus on the task at hand. Derek, I whispered, trying not to draw the creature's attention. Go into the other room and call the police. Tell them it's an emergency. Derek nodded swiftly and made his way out of the attic as quietly as possible. As the creature continued slithering closer, I noticed a canister of industrial strength pesticide in my bag. I had dealt with dangerous creatures before. Maybe this list would slow it down or deter it, if not kill it. There was no guarantee this would work, but I had to do something. Preparing myself for whatever reaction this might provoke, I aimed the nozzle at the approaching monstrosity and pulled the trigger. A strong jet of chemicals sprayed out, dousing the creature head to tail. It screeched in rage and confusion, recoiling from the pesticide. I took advantage of its momentary disorientation and swiftly exited the attic, sprinting down the stairs to join Derek, who was on the phone with emergency services, in a safer part of the house. After waiting what felt like an eternity, police officers finally arrived, their weapons drawn and faces grim. We told them what we had seen in the attic, but their skepticism was overtly apparent as they went up to investigate. Despite their doubt, they could not deny that something was very wrong when they saw for themselves what remained of those unfortunate animals. The police conducted a thorough search throughout the house for any trace of the creature, but came back empty-handed. One officer who seemed familiar with strange occurrences mentioned that there were reports from others who claimed to have encountered a similar creature in their homes or around town along with odd piles of dead animals left behind after each sighting. Desperate for answers, Derek asked around town for information about these mysterious happenings until he spoke with an elderly woman who shared a rumor that the monster terrorizing their small community was called the Ringgrave Beast. According to her, whispers about a dark, serpentine creature had been circulating for generations one so intelligent and cunning that it was nearly impossible to catch or kill. As police continued searching for the creature, we urged them to heed this information. However, they were hesitant to believe. The beast still roamed freely, wreaking havoc and causing dread among residents. Despite our best efforts and adamant warnings, the police could not apprehend the elusive terror, only adding further fuel to the mystery of the engraved beast. In the end, I realized that there was little I, or anyone else, could do against this dreadful opponent. As time went on and the number of attacks increased, we began living in constant fear, always looking over our shoulders in anticipation of their next sudden appearance. The once tight-knit community became riddled with fear and paranoia, leaving everyone questioning when their engraved beast would strike again. A week later, Derek called me to thank me for my help and told me he was moving away from town. He couldn't live knowing a monstrous creature now haunted his thoughts, and neither could I. That night, as Ace rested peacefully by my side, I packed up our belongings and did what any rational human would do. I looked for a new home far away from this sinister presence that had infiltrated our lives. Something I've always been known for, among my friends, is my great sense of humor. I love making people laugh, and they always appreciate it, especially when we're in tough situations. Like that time, we found ourselves in a rundown cabin on the outskirts of Tolingua, Texas. It was supposed to be the vacation of a lifetime, with me and my three best friends, Jenna Watson, Bobby Nolan, and Lila Radcliffe, all taking time off from our jobs to explore the vast wilderness of Big Bend National Park. This trip had everything we could have wanted, laughter, adventure, and camaraderie. But all of that changed when we stumbled upon the decaying cabin deep within the woods. As we entered the musty abode, it felt as if we had stepped into another time, a time when people lived off the land and were self-reliant. 
We found remnants of their existence scattered about, rusty tools, half-empty cans of food, and yellowed photographs stuck to crumbling walls. We speculated on who might have lived here and why they had left it behind. In our normal lives, none of us believed in horror stories or twisted tales. We were pragmatic people, just looking for a break from our everyday routines. We couldn't shake off an uneasy feeling as we moved through the cabin. But then again, we hadn't been out here in complete isolation before either. That night, as we sat around the campfire outside the cabin, because there was no way any of us were going to sleep inside that creepy place, I made jokes and tried to lighten the mood. Whatever you do, I said with a grin on my face. Don't open any ancient books or play with any weird-looking artifacts you find lying around. Jenna laughed nervously as she turned her head to make sure no bizarre runes were nearby. We stayed close together, not for warmth alone but for comfort, as the wind howled through the surrounding trees. Eventually, fatigue claimed us all, and we drifted off into sleep near the dying embers of the fire. I awoke suddenly. The fire was out, and it was pitch dark. Only the stars and a sliver of moonlight provided any illumination. The creaking sound that had roused me from my slumber continued, making me jump. In an instant, Bobby flicked on his flashlight with a shaky hand. There they were, cannibalistic mountain men, tall and menacing. Their twisted faces lit up under the light. They were armed and looked determined to hunt us down. Run! I screamed at my friends as we scrambled in all directions, panicky yet desperate to escape from these relentless monsters descending upon our campsite. As I stumbled through the woods, I could hear Jenna's breathless voice calling my name. We found each other and continued to run together, fumbling our way through the forest while trying to remember how we arrived at this godforsaken place. The sound of snapping branches behind us indicated that our pursuers were getting closer and I knew that we desperately needed to get out of their territory if we wanted to survive. Despite my terror and exhaustion, my instinct for humor kicked in once more. Hey Jenna, I mustered up a weak chuckle between heaving breaths. Remember when we thought this trip would be boring? She shot me an incredulous look while trying desperately not to smile. As we pressed on through the darkness, the relentless hunters gained ground. At some point in our frantic scramble for safety, we lost Bobby and Lila in the chaos of trees and darkness. Images of our once carefree, laughter-filled trip clouded my vision as our reality turned into something out of a nightmarish tale. The cannibalistic hunters relentlessly tracked us until we reached an unexpected clearing. In the weak moonlight, it seemed our escape might be cut short as we now faced a new obstacle, an imposing cliff edge looming before us. With the horrifying mountain men not far behind, we weighed our chances, trying to decide between attempting to climb or fighting back against overwhelming odds. Jenna and I exchanged glances, silently agreeing that our only option for survival was to scale the cliff. As we began our perilous ascent in the dark, the cannibalistic mountain men reached the clearing. Their guttural grunts and snarls were evidence that they were growing more impatient. They fired arrows that barely missed us as we climbed, their deadliness apparent as they lodged into the rocks around us. Somehow, despite our fear and uncertainty, our desire to survive fueled us to keep moving upward. We finally reached a ledge where we could catch our breath and formulate a plan. Our mobile phones had no signal out this deep in the wilderness. We couldn't call for help. Even if we could get a signal, we doubted anyone would reach us in time before these hunters' wicked hands gripped onto us assessing our injuries from the climb. Jenna's leg was bleeding from an arrow graze, but she reassured me that she could still move. From a distance, we spotted another campfire near an old mine entrance on the mountainside. With no other course of action, Jenna and I decided to find whoever made that fire, hoping they might help against these relentless predators. As we cautiously approached the fire-lit entrance of the mine, we introduced ourselves to a man who looked sturdy and battle-hardened. His name was Ray, and he was an old-timer who lived off-grid for years. He knew about survival in these harsh terrains. He informed us about these cannibalistic mountain men's origins, generations spanning from moonshiners hidden within the rugged terrain to evade law enforcement back then. Over time, isolation had driven their descendants into a twisted lifestyle fortified with violence. Ray offered us shelter and weapons for defense inside his makeshift dwelling within the mine as he tended to Jenna's injuries. 
Together with Ray, we managed to barricade ourselves against the imminent assault of these ferocious hunters. We devised a plan to trap and separate them, using Ray's extensive knowledge of the mine to our advantage. Clustered together, we waited in silence within the cave's depth, our hearts pounding against our chests as we listened to their heavy footsteps approaching. Abruptly, the first hunter burst into the mine, his hands dripping with blood, possibly Bobby or Lilas. I fought the urge to scream in anger and despair. With precise timing, we executed our plan. The hungry monster fell into a deep pit. Ray had dug under a thin layer of camouflage, which subsequently trapped him. Many gruesome battles ensued in that cave. Snap bones, crushed heads, and the eerie shrieks of pain from both humans and their monstrous attackers reverberated within its cold walls. It was a prolonged conflict that tested every ounce of our willpower and strength. Before leaving the cave after temporarily incapacitating at least one of them, Ray revealed that there was no surefire way of eliminating them entirely, only slowing them down. Over time, these men acquired unexpected resilience due to their twisted diet and extreme living conditions. We escaped just in time as reinforcements for the cannibals drew near, an overwhelming force set on devouring us. As we raced through the trees under a canopy of moonlight, I couldn't help but wonder about Bobby and Lila's fate. Their cheerful smiles flashed before my eyes. We couldn't afford to lose hope of finding them. Back at our campsite, woven into an unexpected ambush by the hunters who outsmarted even Ray himself, Ray and Jenna were seized while I narrowly escaped detection by hiding beneath a pile of leaves. I helplessly watched my friends be dragged away. Only then did I realize how clever and strategic these monsters really were. Overwhelmed with panic, I found myself once again alone in enemy territory, just like when this dreadful nightmare began. Despite my fear, a new wave of determination swept over me. I couldn't let the grim fate of my friends dampen my spirit. With Ray's valuable insight into combating these horrifying foes, there remained a glimmer of hope. I vowed to return for my friends by whatever means necessary. Unbeknownst to me, the cannibalistic mountain men had already set their minds on adding another trophy to their twisted collection. Me. Endlessly pursued by an intelligent enemy I never could have imagined, my life was no longer just filled with laughter, but entwined with unimaginable terror. In this battle for survival, a new chapter had begun. My name is Milo Maccabee, and I've been an exterminator for a good decade now. I never had a conventional 9-to-5 office job. Instead, I preferred getting down and dirty, ridding the world of creepy crawlies. What can I say? Unpopular jobs suit unpopular names. One balmy Tuesday afternoon in June, I got a call about a pest problem at an old house located outside of Providence, Rhode Island. The homeowner complained about strange noises and peculiar smells seeping through the walls. Plagued by gusts of uneasy sensations and chills running through their bodies, they believed it was a creature that needed dealing with. So I was the guy they called. As I approached the site, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary from the outside, but then again, appearances could be deceiving. With my equipment in tow, I gave the doorbell a chime and was greeted by a middle-aged man who looked quite unnerved. Ah, you must be the exterminator, he said with relief in his voice. Thank you for coming on such short notice. Sure thing, I replied cheerfully. What seems to be the problem? Inside the house, I began doing my routine check for signs of infestation. While making jokes about exterminators sniffing out pests like bloodhounds, suddenly, out of nowhere, there was a crashing noise from upstairs. The homeowner and I exchanged alarmed glances. What was that? He stammered as we both began climbing the stairs cautiously. The most peculiar sight awaited me on the second floor. Shattered glass everywhere and a distinct smell of rotting meat assaulted my senses. Upon investigation, remnants of an oversized rat or mouse hung from one of the open glass shards. But it wasn't normal. Strange, I muttered as we drew closer to examine it. As our eyes scanned over the shredded remains, we both jumped at the sound of another crash. Rushing into the next room, we stared in shock at something so bizarre and horrifying that I struggled to find words. A grotesque creature resembling a rat but with razor-like claws, sharp, gnashing teeth, and deadened, black eyes. It hissed and twirled something inconsequential but grisly in its grip. An intense sense of fear washed over me, 
as its white-rimmed eyes locked onto mine before it darted swiftly under the bed. My gaze shifted to the startled man beside me, exchanging thoughts on what we had witnessed. We need to find this thing before it disappears and does more harm, he exclaimed, his voice halting with panic. Grabbing my extermination tools firmly, I hesitantly agreed. Whatever that thing is, I said grimly, it doesn't belong here. Treading warily through the house, we searched desperately for any sign of that monstrous creature, but found nothing. The smell, so powerful before now, seemed to have dissipated. With a sense of urgency, I decided to call the police for assistance. The homeowner agreed, realizing that this situation was beyond our capabilities. As we anxiously awaited their arrival, I tried to gather as much information as possible from the homeowner about his experiences with the creature. He mentioned a local historian who had once visited his home, discussing the property's extensive history and some bizarre incidents that occurred there in the past. When the police arrived, we showed them the damage caused by the creature and insisted that they listen to our surreal testimony. Some officers were visibly skeptical, but agreed to help us search for any signs of the unusual antagonist. Despite our collective efforts combing every inch of the house, we failed to find any trace of this grotesque rat-like predator. Frustrated and fearful, I decided to visit the local historian mentioned by the homeowner. Upon explaining my encounter with this inexplicable creature, the historian confirmed my fears concerning its existence. The ominous creature went by many names and local legends, but one that seemed most relevant was Crethar. According to ancient lore, Crethar was a malevolent entity known for spreading disease and terrorizing unsuspecting victims. Returning home, I spent sleepless nights researching Crethar, trying to uncover its origin and motives for tormenting people. Each passing moment fueled my determination to eradicate this monstrous being before it claimed more lives and shattered more peace. It wasn't long before news spread throughout Providence of other grisly incidents involving a similar mysterious creature. People reported not animal remains in their homes or peculiar smells, making them feel uneasy. Police were baffled. There was no denying that something strange and dangerous was stalking our town. Deciding it was time for action, I tracked down Crethar's gruesome trail and enlisted help from trusted colleagues in my extermination business, which specializes in peculiar pests. Armed with custom-modified extermination tools designed to capture but not kill the creature, we devised a plan to corner and apprehend Crethar. A new surge of terror washed over Providence as the day arrived, the impeccable preparations filled with uncertain outcomes. With police forces involved in our plan, we staged locations in various parts of town for Crether to be attracted to and inevitably spring our trap. As dusk fell and night cast its chilling veil, each team took position at their designated location. Our relentless pursuit unfolded with sickening events. Crethar's gory attacks left a trail of pain and devastation. We progressively closed in on the beast, chasing it from one spot to another. Our ultimate confrontation happened at an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. Cornered by our knowledgeable team and officers, Crethar hissed and snarled menacingly, sensing that his reign was nearing its end. One brave police officer managed to trap Crethar beneath a thick net despite sustaining severe injuries from its razor-like claws. But much to our collective horror, within seconds, the creature's grotesque body began dissolving into an oozing black mass before disappearing entirely, leaving nothing behind but putrid fumes that singed our senses. In the aftermath of this appalling episode, we concluded that Crithar could not be captured nor killed. Its mysterious existence was something no mortal being could comprehend. Yet its disappearance left behind an eerie silence in the town, the remaining horrifying memories causing grim furrows on the brows. The only consolation derived from our battle with Kretar was limiting its damages and possibly preventing further chaos. For now, Providence may continue walking on eggshells, knowing that such a malevolent force might someday return or shift elsewhere to sow more despair and affliction. While I returned to my profession as an exterminator, a constant sense of unease would forever accompany me. Knowing too well about this extraordinarily sinister creature lurking somewhere unknown, and even though Kritar's dreadful aura remained a looming presence, I couldn't help but feel satisfied that we had not just survived but persevered against such unique terror.
This experience would become part of the legacy I leave behind, a chilling tale of enduring darkness and the unparalleled resilience of those who refused to surrender. As I continued my work as an exterminator, that peeved part inside hoped never to encounter Krethar again. Yet another, more courageous fragment sought it out, for there was always unfinished business to attend to in this unending battle between good and evil. I remember I often told myself, no job is too tough for me. I'd been an exterminator by trade for almost a decade. My name is Murray Finkelstein. The pay was good, and I took pride in my work. That was until the fateful day when I was called out to a small house in Ridgeview, Delaware, September 23rd. It had been raining relentlessly that morning. Sluggy, wet days like these made my job much worse, but life has to go on. My client seemed anxious on the phone, but it was just another regular call. Get rid of some bugs. It shouldn't take long. John and Emma Brown lived in that small house with their three-year-old daughter, Amanda. Their residence provided a cozy ambience. However, as they began to describe their infestation problem, dread seeped into the atmosphere. They couldn't see anything crawling, but a distinct scratching noise echoed through their walls at night. I shrugged it off as rodents and readied my gear. This wasn't exactly new in my line of work. While scouring their basement for signs of entry or nests, unsettling feelings crept upon me, making my hair stand on end. Everything seemed normal. Still, something felt off. The crew arrived later that day, and just as we started setting up traps and spraying chemicals to discourage any intruders from coming back, we heard it. The scratching sound within the walls was jarring, yet barely audible amidst the drops of rain, except for the fact that it seemed to mimic our movements. As darkness fell over Ridgeview, bewildered with curiosity about the unknown creature lurking within those walls, we equipped ourselves with flashlights and cautiously peeled back portions of drywall where we'd heard the scratching earlier. What welcomed us was horrifying. Multiple bloody scratches clawed into the walls wouldn't support beams as if an enraged animal tried to escape. A coppery smell of old blood lingered and the air felt heavy. Suddenly we heard a faint thud and before we knew it, the basement door slammed shut, locking us in. Cold sweat drenched my brow. This wasn't normal. I had never encountered anything like this before. Hours passed as we tried to break the door open, but it wouldn't budge as though an unseen force held it shut. Hopelessness washed over us. That's when we saw it. The creature had tried to remain hidden from our sight, but a slight twitch revealed it bathed in the dim light of our flashlights. The atrocity appeared barely recognizable, as a human, twisted limbs and contorted features wrapped snake-like around the pipes, while its soulless eyes locked onto us, it was responsible for the horrific scratches on the wall. Breathing intensified as panic hit me like a lead weight. Nobody dared move. A game of predator and prey unfolded before our eyes, with us as unwilling participants fighting for survival. The once unremarkable basement morphed into a chamber of claustrophobic dread as our chances of escape seemed slim. My hands trembled as I mustered up enough courage to text John Brown for help. He should be able to get to us with desperation radiating from each word I typed. John, something went wrong. The basement door is locked. Please break it down. Seconds felt like hours, waiting for his response. Minutes turned to hours and there was still no response from John Brown. The monstrous creature slithered around the basement, never taking its inhuman gaze off us. My crew and I remained paralyzed, unsure of when it would attack. The realization that the police might be our only hope spurred me on. Trembling, with my eyes continuously darting to the abomination, I managed to dial 911, whispering the details of our situation. The trapped crew, the strange creature to the operator on the other side of the line felt like an arduous task. But then a sudden chilling thought emerged. What if this thing could understand our language? The creature's horrible appearance made it evident that it wasn't an ordinary human anymore. It had distorted limbs that coiled around beams and pipes like a snake, and its flesh appeared to be rotting away from its deformed body. The creature had lost all resemblance to whatever person it might have once been. As we waited for help to arrive, I tried contacting neighbors or anyone in the vicinity who might enlighten us about this anomaly. Eventually, I managed to reach Mr. Lawson from two houses down, an elderly resident who had a flair for local history. 
Mr. Lawson informed us that decades ago, a misfortune had befallen a house in Ridgeview, this very house, where an unexpected fire claimed several lives, including a gifted young scientist named Dr. Elias Whitley, whom we now suspected to be our twisted intruder. Wearing down physically and mentally while trapped in that cramped space, thoughts of past victims haunted me. Those who paid with their lives for crossing paths with this monstrosity. How many had suffered at its disfigured hands before we got here? Finally, piercing sirens greeted our ears. Relief washed over us momentarily before fear grasped hold once more. The merciless monster retaliated against our hope viciously. A seemingly impossible combination of rage and envy powered its unpredictable movements as it clawed and bit at my crew, their screams resonating through the basement. The police forced their way into the house, only to be paralyzed by the gruesome scene before them. The twisted creature momentarily paused its savage onslaught, alas, not out of fear, but a sickening amusement. Its blood-stained hands were powerful enough to deter even the most composed officers. Realizing that more harm than good would come from a direct confrontation with this malevolent force, I managed to muster up enough strength between tremors to instruct the police to evacuate everyone that remained unharmed. With dread in their hearts, they complied. As they retreated from the chaos and terror, something unexpected happened. Our antagonist, Whitley, vanished without a trace. The life-changing events that occurred in that basement left us all changed forever. My crew workers quit the very next day. My career and confidence were shattered in one fell swoop. From that day on, I've carried an intense and consuming obsession to decipher what happened on September 23rd. But maybe some horrors are beyond our understanding. Perhaps some mysteries must remain hidden behind fortress-like walls of cryptic terror. Shackled by memories of the twisted limbs, contorted features, and endless desperation for an escape that never arrived, I moved far away from Ridgeview. Even now, though distance separates me from that cursed place where the lines of our reality blurred without warning, I find myself haunted by nightmares of unfathomable dread that keep me recoiling from every scratch on my walls and an unnerving gaze that lingers just a moment too long. I remember thinking how strange it was for the birds to be so quiet that morning. Normally, the chirping and rustling in the trees was an unwelcome accompaniment to my morning coffee, but today it seemed like a forgotten melody. I suppose we all have our peculiar routines, but the little things matter, you know? At the time, this silence meant nothing more than an odd start to my day. It wasn't until later that I discovered the horrifying influence behind it. I had a job scheduled at a small house on the outskirts of town. Believe me when I say, there's no pest I can't handle. Garrett Caldwell isn't just a name, it's a promise. The frantic homeowner had called about an infestation of some sort or another, and in no time at all, I arrived at her front door. With the toolbox in hand and determination in my heart, I descended into the house's decrepit basement. Just be careful. She called after me as I took each step gingerly into the darkness below, and good luck. As an exterminator, you encounter a whole host of creepy crawlies and spine-tingling situations. But nothing could prepare me for what lay deep within that dank pit of disarray and decay. Feigned rays of sunlight scattered across the floor from a small window above revealed countless insects, twitching wildly on their backs or supplicating grandly for mercy before succumbing to their final breaths. It was disgusting, completely unexplainable. But it meant something had disrupted these creatures' natural order, causing them to meet their ends under such bizarre circumstances. The deeper I ventured into that hellish basement, the more uneasy I felt. At first, even I considered turning back without finishing the job, something that had never once happened to me over years of, of professional work. But every instinctual fear warring within me stopped short as I stumbled across the source of all this death, an enormous, pulsating mass that clung to the far corner of the room. It had to be at least eight feet tall and countless insects writhed within it like prisoners caught in a webbed cell. I swallowed thickly as I observed its grayish skin or exoskeleton, conceding the impossibility of reason. Its shape was all too jarringly organic, despite the lack of any discernible face or defining features. As if sensing my presence, it suddenly heightened its grotesque pulsating and screeched an unholy noise, 
like nails scraped against chalkboards. Recoiling, I darted around and spied a weak timber support holding up part of the ceiling above the monstrosity. Desperation seized me as the creature seemed to emerge from its corner. I sprang towards the beam, heedless of whether or not there would be repercussions. Haste overtook caution as I slammed into it with everything I had, weaponizing my usually helpful toolbox in one last desperate attempt for survival. With a sickening groan, the ancient beam began giving way and collapsed entirely within moments. The combination of concrete and rubble cascaded onto that writhing abomination like divine vengeance striking down on the wicked below. I stumbled back from underneath an unraveled wire that snaked dangerously close to my face amid screams so guttural that they mimic humanity's worst nightmares while seeking sanctuary from the destruction ensuing around me, my heart racing. Quickly, I emerged from the disheveled basement, covered in dust and debris from the fallen beam. The homeowner, anxiously waiting in the living room, gasped as I re-emerged. What happened down there? She asked frantically, fear in her eyes. I hesitated before answering. It's taken care of for now, but I need you to leave the house immediately and call the police. Her confusion was tangible, but she complied without question. We both scrambled out of the house and dialed for help. I decided not to call anyone else for assistance as I didn't want to bring anyone else into harm's way until we knew more about this creature. As we waited for the police to arrive, my thoughts raced. How could something like this exist? And why here out of all places? Moreover, either name nor identification fit the creature, the likes of which had never been seen nor documented in history. The responding officials initially thought our emergency call was a hoax. But upon seeing my disheveled state and hearing testimony from the homeowner, they ventured into the house with caution. A few restraining orders upstairs minimized the damage to prevent further collapse upon their discovery of the grisly site below. When they returned to us outside, their expressions were a combination of disbelief and horror. They immediately set up a perimeter around the house, calling in backup and biohazard containment teams. Despite being advised against it, I stayed close by throughout the day. Due to my first-hand encounter with that abhorrent mass and corresponding expertise dealing with pests, maybe there was information or insight I could provide if needed. As things seemingly began settling down, a young officer approached me during his break. He confided in me that he had heard a rumor about something similar happening miles away. A farmer discovered mutilated livestock near his property almost as if someone or something had drained them of their very essence. He recalled that the farmer mentioned a reclusive man living on the outskirts of a town named Abram. Rumors suggested that Abram was involved in grisly experiments and was avoided by locals like the plague. My mind sparked with intensity as I pieced together the puzzle. Was this creature somehow tied to that suspect Abram? Could he be responsible for its manifestation? The police investigated my suspicions, and further questioning of the farmer confirmed that traces of the same grayish material found in my encounter were discovered at his farm as well. When law enforcement went to question Abram, they found his home abandoned, with evidence strongly suggesting that he had fled in haste. Despite their best efforts to gather and analyze forensic evidence from both crime scenes, investigators never unearthed a solid lead on Abram's location or intentions. Inexplicably, it seemed that he had vanished without a trace, leaving only the gruesome remnants of his diabolical experimentation. The biohazard team successfully contained and removed the monstrous creature from beneath the house. But disquieting questions lingered ominously over these events, primarily regarding the fate of this inhuman villain named Abram. As time went on, Neighbors whispered about the terrifying occurrences in hushed tones while walking their dogs or getting their mail, sharing theories about what happened, but none dared investigate any further. An eerie tension persisted in every corner of our once peaceful town. And while life tentatively returned to normalcy after several weeks passed, I couldn't shake the underlying sensation of chilling dread, knowing that a man capable of creating such a monstrosity was still out there somewhere. Haunted by shadows and ever watchful for danger, I now take solace in one frightening realization. Sometimes there are horrors far worse than any nightmare lurking just beneath our feet, waiting, biding their time until the moment comes to strike, again. 
That morning, I was getting ready for another workday as an exterminator on the outskirts of Tulsa, Oklahoma. After years on the job, you would think there's not much left to surprise me. But little did I know that that day would be anything but ordinary. My assignment was a large warehouse complex that had been experiencing a rat infestation over the past few weeks. The foreman at the site, Randy, greeted me with a hearty laugh and clapped his hand on my shoulder. Good to see you again, Martin Hartwell. Those rats are starting to chew through everything, even the electrical wiring. We need your expertise. As I commenced my inspection of the premises, I couldn't help but notice an unusual trail of grime along the floor near one corner of the warehouse. It seemed to lead from a pile of not-upon food crates towards a small hole in the wall. Intrigued, I decided to take a closer look. Following the trail with caution, I moved toward the hole and appeared inside using my flashlight. To my surprise, instead of finding ravenous rats, it seemed as though something else had been residing within this hidden crevice, something even more sinister than any rodent. As I continued my investigation, Randy approached me apprehensively. I didn't want to mention this earlier because it sounds downright crazy, he whispered nervously. But some of my workers claim they've seen things lurking around here at night, like some kind of creature, unlike anything they've ever seen before. Curiosity peaked and we continued our search together. We discovered several more trails showing evidence of some sort of life form inhabiting the depths of this warehouse complex. But there was no sign or clear indication as to what exactly this being might be. Rummaging through every corner and crevice together, we stumbled upon a locked door towards the back end of the facility. Using a pair of bolt cutters, Randy and I forced our way in. Inside, the room appeared to have been repurposed as a makeshift lair. The stench of rot was acrid in the air, and we quickly discovered what appeared to be remnants of small animals dismembered by some kind of savage force. I couldn't help but feel an overwhelming sense of dread as the reality of the situation washed over us. This was no ordinary extermination job. Something terrifying and unexplainable had made its den here in our unsuspecting warehouse complex. As night fell upon us, bizarre scratching noises resonated from the walls while shadows flickered ominously in every corner. With each passing hour, I found myself more and more troubled by this unseen menace. As we dove deeper into the darkness, we finally stumbled upon a horrifying scene. One of Randy's workers was lying on the floor, a look of abject terror etched across his face. Tiny claw-like marks covered his body, clearly made with incredible force and precision. The terror in both our hearts grew. If this creature could maim a grown man so gruesomely, what else was it capable of? Driven to act, we resolved to defend ourselves from whatever attacked him. Armed with makeshift weapons and emboldened by our camaraderie, we tentatively ventured back into the black abyss that was once a mere warehouse. Suddenly, out of nowhere, we heard an inhuman screech echoing behind us, followed by rapid footsteps that seemed to surround us. The screeching sound sent a jolt through us, followed by the rapid footsteps closing in. We braced ourselves for the imminent confrontation with the mysterious creature. As panic and fear started consuming us, I realized we had two options. Either we should call the police for help or face whatever terror awaited us on our own. Randy and I, without uttering a word, knew we didn't want to involve anyone else in this situation and risk their lives. We decided we had enough of being hunted. It was time to become the hunters. Both armed with anything we could find, pipes, crowbars, and even a fire extinguisher, we marched determinately towards where we thought the creature had retreated. In one corner of the warehouse furthest from where we had found the worker's body, a stack of crates and debris seemed to be intentionally placed, as if to conceal a hiding spot. With every step closer to it, the air seemed to thicken and the sense of dread grew stronger. There was no turning back now. A sudden cracking sound drew our attention. It came from the pile of crates near the wall where we found yet another mangled body lying motionless on the ground next to a shattered crate. The sight was just as horrifying as before, scratches covering every inch of their skin, terror still gripping their lifeless faces. Our eyes darted back towards toward the hiding spot, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever had caused so much destruction. Then it happened. A spine-chilling creature emerged from behind the crates, finally revealing itself. A slimy black body that seemed to undulate like thick molasses slid towards us in an unnatural movement. 
Its bulbous eyes stared unblinkingly at us. The grotesque sight made our stomachs churn in revulsion, but our minds were set. We attacked with everything we had in us. Randy swung his pipe through the air while I thrust the crowbar towards the slick body. Despite our adrenaline-fueled aggression, our attempts to fend off the monster seemed futile. It evaded our strikes with ease, a frightening display of cunning and agility. In an instant, it lunged forward, managing to graze Randy's arm with its razor-sharp claws. Randy screamed in agony as blood poured down his arm. The creature seemed pleased with its success, maintaining eye contact with us as if assuring its dominance over us mere humans. I couldn't reach my phone, but I knew I had to do something. Summoning all my strength and courage, I grabbed the fire extinguisher and unleashed a concentrated blast of cold fury at the creature in a desperate attempt to slow it down. But instead of slowing down or showing any signs of vulnerability, the creature simply retracted into the darkness that was its veil from which it appeared. Randy and I stared at each other in confusion and fear, unsure of whether we had successfully driven it away or angered it further. As we stood there panting and recovering from the intense ordeal, one of the warehouse workers who had been hiding nearby revealed himself. His face was pale with terror as he clutched his radio close to his chest, broadcasting live news coverage about similar gruesome attacks occurring all over town. What's that thing's name? Is this some kind of epidemic? Randy asked urgently. The news just dubbed it the Slicer, whispered the worker before falling silent as the grim reality dawned upon him too. Could we have driven the Slicer away for good? Or was this beast merely bidding its time for more victims to fall prey? As we stood on guard in the darkness of an ordinary workday turned hellish nightmare, an eerie silence settled over us. How would we face whatever lay ahead?